Letter 9. On Philosophy and Friendship. You desire to know whether Epicurus is right when, in one of his letters, he rebukes those who hold that a wise man is self-sufficient, and for that reason does not stand in need of friendships. This is the objection raised by Epicurus against Stilbo, and those who believe that the supreme good is a soul which is insensible to feeling. We are bound to meet with a double meaning if we try to express the Greek term lack of feeling summarily in a single word rendering it by the Latin word impotentia. For it may be understood in the meaning the opposite to that which we wish to have it. What we mean to express is a soul which rejects any sensation of evil. But people will interpret the idea as that of a soul which can endure no evil. Consider, therefore, whether it is not better to say a soul that cannot be harmed, or a soul entirely beyond the realm of suffering. There is this difference between ourselves and the other school. Our ideal wise man feels his troubles, but overcomes them. Their wise man does not even feel them, but we and they alike hold this idea, that the wise man is self-sufficient. Nevertheless, he desires friends, neighbours and associates, no matter how much he is sufficient unto himself. And mark how self-sufficient he is, for on occasion he can be content with a part of himself. If he loses a hand through disease or war, or if some accident puts out one or both of his eyes, he will be satisfied with what is left, taking as much pleasure in his impaired and maimed body as he took when it was sound. But while he does not pine for these parts if they are missing, he prefers not to lose them. In this sense the wise man is self-sufficient, that he can do without friends, not that he desires to do without them. When I say can, I mean this, he endures the loss of a friend with equanimity. But he need never lack friends, for it lies in his own control how soon he shall make good a loss. Just as Phidias, if he lose a statue, can straightway carve another, even so our master in the art of making friendships can fill the place of a friend he has lost. If you ask how one can make oneself a friend quickly, I will tell you, provided we agree that I may pay my debt at once and square the account so far as this letter is concerned. Hecato says, I can show you a filter compounded with drugs, herbs, or any witch's incantation. If you would be loved, love. Now there is a great pleasure, not only in maintaining old and established friendships, but also in beginning and acquiring new ones. There is the same difference between winning a new friend and having already won him, as there is between a farmer who sows and a farmer who reaps. The philosopher Attalus used to say, it is more pleasant to make than to keep a friend, as it is more pleasant to the artist to paint than to have finished painting. When one is busy and absorbed in one's work, the very absorption affords great delight. But when one has withdrawn one's hand from the completed masterpiece, the pleasure is not so keen. Henceforth, it is the fruits of his art that he enjoys. It was the art itself that he enjoyed while he was painting. In the case of our children, their young manhood yields the more abundant fruits, but their infancy was sweeter. Let us now return to the question. The wise man, I say, self-sufficient though he be, nevertheless desires friends if only for the purpose of practicing friendship in order that his noble qualities may not lie dormant. Not, however, for the purpose mentioned by Epicurus in the letter quoted above, that there may be someone to sit by him when he is ill, to help him when he is in prison or in want, but that he may have someone by whose sick bed he himself may sit, someone a prisoner in hostile hands who he himself may set free. He who regards himself only and enters upon friendship for this reason reckons wrongly. The end will be like the beginning. He has made friends with one who might assist him out of bondage. At the first rattle of a chain, such a friend will desert him. These are so-called fair-weather friends. One who is chosen for the sake of utility will be satisfactory only so long as he is useful. Hence, prosperous men are blockaded by troops of friends. But those who have failed stand amid the vast loneliness their friends fleeing from the very crisis which is to test their worth. Hence, also, 
we notice those many shameful cases of persons who, through fear, desert or betray. The beginning and the end cannot but harmonize. He who begins to be your friend because it pays will also cease because it pays. A man will be attracted by some reward offered in exchange for his friendship if he be attracted by aught in friendship other than friendship itself. For what purpose, then, do I make a man my friend? In order to have someone for whom I may die, whom I may follow into exile, against whose death I may stake my own life and pay the pledge to. The friendship which you portray is a bargain and not a friendship. It regards convenience only and looks to the results. Beyond question, the feeling of a lover has in it something akin to friendship. One might call it a friendship run mad, but though this is true, does anyone love for the sake of gain or promotion or renown? Pure love, careless of all other things, kindles a soul with desire for the beautiful object, not without hope of return of the affection. What then? Can a cause which is more honourable produce a passion that is base? You may retort, we are now discussing the question whether friendship is to be cultivated for its own sake. On the contrary, nothing more urgently requires demonstration. For if friendship is to be sought for its own sake, he may seek it who is self-sufficient. How then, you ask, does he seek it? Precisely as he seeks an object of great beauty not attracted to it by desire for gain, nor yet frightened by the instability of fortune. One who seeks friendship for favourable occasions strips it of all its nobility. The wise man is self-sufficient. This phrase, my dear Lasilius, is incorrectly explained by many, for they withdraw the wise man from the world and force him to dwell within his own skin. But we must mark with care what this sentence signifies and how far it applies. The wise man is sufficient unto himself for a happy existence, but not for a mere existence. For he needs many helps towards mere existence, but for a happy existence he needs only a sound and upright soul, one that despises fortune. I should like also to state to you one of the distinctions of Chrysippus, who declares that the wise man is in want of nothing, and yet needs many things. On the one hand, he says, nothing is needed by the fool, for he does not understand how to use anything, but he is in want of everything. The wise man needs hands, eyes, and many things that are necessary for his daily use, but he is in want of nothing, for want implies a necessity, and nothing is necessary to the wise man. Therefore, although he is self-sufficient, yet he has need of friends. He craves as many friends as possible, not, however, that he may live happily, for he will live happily even without friends. The supreme good calls for no practical aids from outside. It is developed at home and arises entirely within itself. If the good seeks any portion of itself from without, it begins to be subject to the play of fortune. People may say, but what sort of existence will the wise man have if he be left friendless when thrown into prison, or when stranded on some foreign nation, or when delayed on a long voyage, or when out upon the lonely shore? His life will be like that of Jupiter, who, amid the dissolution of the world, when the gods have confounded together and nature rests for a space from her work, can retire into himself and give himself over to his own thoughts. In some such way as this, the sage will act. He will retreat into himself and live with himself. As long as he is allowed to order his affairs according to his judgment, he is self-sufficient. And marries a wife, he is self-sufficient. And brings up children, he is self-sufficient and yet could not live as if he had to live without the society of man. Natural promptings, and not his own selfish needs, draw him to friendships. For just as other things have for us an inherent attractiveness, so has friendship. As we hate solitude and crave society, as nature draws men to each other, so in this matter also there is an attraction which makes us desirous of friendship. Nevertheless, Though the sage may love his friends dearly, often comparing them with himself and putting them ahead of himself, 
yet all the good will be limited to his own being, and he will speak the words which were spoken by the very Stilbo, whom Epicurus criticised in his letter. For Stilbo, after his country was captured and his children and wife lost, as he emerged from the general desolation alone and yet happy, spoke as follows to Demetrius, called Sacker of the Cities because of the destruction he brought upon them, in answer to the question whether he had lost anything. I have all my goods with me. There is a brave and stout-hearted man for you. The enemy conquered, but Stilbo conquered his conqueror. I have lost nothing. Aye, he forced Demetrius to wonder whether he himself had conquered after all. My goods are all with me. In other words, he deemed nothing that might be taken from him to be good. We marvel at certain animals because they pass through fire and suffer no bodily harm. But how much more marvellous is a man who has marched forth unhurt and unscathed through fire and sword and devastation? Do you understand now how much easier it is to conquer a whole tribe than to conquer one man? This saying of Stilbo makes common ground with Stoicism. The Stoic can also carry his goods unimpaired through cities that have been burned to ashes, for he is self-sufficient. Such are the bounds which he sets on his own happiness. But you must not think that our school alone can utter noble words. Epicurus himself, the reviler of Stilbo, spoke similar language. Put it down to my credit, though I have already wiped out my debt for the present day. He says, Whoever does not regard what he has as most ample wealth is unhappy, though he may be master of the whole world. Or if the following seems to you to be a more suitable phrase, for we must try to render the meaning and not the mere words. A man may rule the world and still be unhappy if he does not feel that he is supremely happy. In order, however, that you may know that these sentiments are universal, suggested, of course, by nature, you will find in one of the comic poets this verse. Unblessed is he who thinks himself unblessed. Or what does your condition matter if it is bad in your own eyes? You may say, what then, if yonder man, rich by base means, and yonder man, lord of many but slave of more, shall call themselves happy, will their own opinion make them happy? It matters not what one says, but what one feels. Also, not how one feels on one particular day, but how one feels at all times. There is no reason, however, why you should fear that this great privilege will fall into unworthy hands. Only the wise man is pleased with his own. Folly is never troubled with weariness of itself. Farewell.